Hey guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU you didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. On a bonus episode of Arn, the Enforcer watches back Beach Blast 92 with the ultimate heel and baby face in Rick Rude and Ricky Steamboat. Draw me a baby face. Something that everybody could get behind. Kids, women, old folks, young folks, men, you know, all guys wanted to be him. Women, I'm sure, wanted to be with him. Uh, He was the all-around package. On volume 55 of the Ask Conrad series, Conrad talks about some of his dream podcast partners, including a couple of degenerates. You know, from inside the business and taking over and NXT and all that, I don't think you could get a better podcast partner than Triple H there, just because he's done so much. However, if you're talking about wanting to learn more about the psychology of wrestling and what makes a match and how to develop talent and all that, could you beat Shawn Michaels? That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks. And of course, we couldn't do it. Without the Hall of Famer, your friend and mine, Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? I am doing great. Had a nice weekend in Deadwood, South Dakota. Have you ever seen the series Deadwood? I loved it, you cocksucker. Yeah. <laughs> Every word was cocksucker. <laughs> and I, I had been through Deadwood. You know, when you go to Sturgis, you Deadwood's only I don't know, 20 miles away or whatever it is. And uh, I've been through it, but it was always during bike week, and it was, you know, town of a thousand people that had 12,000 motorcycles in town visiting. So it was never, never really got a chance just to walk around and feel the vibe and get into a little bit of the history. But we did that. We had three days in Deadwood and just had a fantastic time. Really nice people in Deadwood, wrestling fans out the wazoo. So that was, it was just great. And we had a blast. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And I hope everyone is having a fantastic Memorial day. We want to thank everybody for their service. Uh, a lot of people get to take today off and kick back and enjoy, and we need to remember why we have the opportunity to do that. So thank a veteran, uh, and and let's go out of our way to let them know how much we appreciate them. And hopefully you appreciated a fun wrestling weekend, uh, and full transparency, Eric and I are recording before the Saudi show and before double or nothing. So we won't be able to talk about that today, but we will next week. I'm sure of it, (laughs) but, uh, a lot of people are buzzing about what's next and I can't wait to break it down and talk about it long form next week. But today we're going to be revisiting one of the more iconic characters and performers of my fandom. And certainly through all of WCW Lex Luger, and we're going to zero in on his 1998 And it's 1999. Now we've, we've discussed what he had done up until this point in the archives over at 83 weeks on youtube.com. So be sure to check that out. But I would say as we come to a close in 1997, Lex Luger is pretty firmly the number two baby face behind only sting as a reminder, Hollywood Hogan has taken two pinfall losses for the world title once to Luger on the 100th edition of nitro August 4th, 1997. And of course, famously sting at Starcade 97. Would you agree with that? That sting and Luger were your top baby faces here at the end of 97. Yeah. You got to put Goldberg in there too, man. Well, he's just really getting going at 97. I mean, he, his debut is, yeah, he was, he wasn't main event level. Yeah. So by, by that standard, yeah. At that point in Bill's career, I think that's a, that's a very fair statement. Um, He's going to wind up putting buff over at Starcade to end the year. Uh, and obviously buff is enjoying quite a run as a single star. I mean, he has been really a tag team specialist for most of his run here in WCW, but now with this, as Bruce would call it a fresh paint of coat, uh, here at, uh, this new, this new heel character Luger is actually going to drop the fall to him. And, and, and you've even been honest about hesitancy to even do business with Lex Luger, but boy, he proved himself 
and he came in for what you felt like was a low ball offer and, and proved that he could be a team player and a real asset a couple years into this experiment. Cause that happened, you know, in the fall of, of 95 and, and fast forward now just over two years, you're feeling pretty good about your decision to bring Lex back now. I think it was one of the better decisions that I made during that period of time, actually, without doubt when it comes to talent, but even overall, that was such a great idea. And I was hoping that that would come up and we don't want to revisit things that we've already covered in detail in the past. But I think if you, for me, when I look at that arc, for lack of a better term, that timeline between Lex coming in for the very first time under the circumstances that we've documented to death, but the transition as as a professional and just as a person that Lex made just, you know, set some of the other issues aside with, with addiction and things like that. But just in terms of the way Lex conducted business and the way he interacted with everybody, backstage, the way he reacted, responded to creative, which sometimes put him in a great light. As you pointed out, beat Hulk Hogan, hundredth anniversary, blah, blah, or hundredth episode. But when you look at the transition that Lex Luger made in that relatively short period of time, he was so dependable. He was, and when I say utility player, that, that sounds almost a little derisive or derogatory, but you could put Lex at the very, you could put him up at the top, put him in the main event, and it's going to work well. He can ride shotgun, be semi-main event, as you pointed out, maybe that number two position under Sting, no matter, or just putting people over because he understood that in order to build viable competition on the roster and have matches that made sense, you can't do it with the same six guys over and over and over again. You've got to keep you know, getting people over and elevating and Lex never batted an eye. If he did question a creative direction decision that didn't involve Lex Luger getting the spotlight, he may ask a question, but only in the context of being able to understand exactly what we're doing so that he could be a hundred percent. You know, a lot of times you lay out, I've heard matches laid out, you know, sitting in the, in the, in the locker room, you know, from, from the ground up, you know, laying out a match and the best matches are the ones where both talents really understand the why of it. Mm. What's the goal of it beyond just having a great match. Great matches are great. We love to watch them. They're visually you know, exciting. They're, Get your attention, you get sucked into it, and that's such an important part of all of this, obviously. But when two people, two, two people in a ring that are gonna do that dance for six minutes, eight minutes, twelve minutes, sixty minutes, doesn't matter, and they both understand the why of it, I don't know, the quality is just so much better. And in, in my experience. And Lex, like I said, the only time he asked questions was to get a complete picture and understand the why of it so that he could deliver. It was, he was a joy to work. He really was. Let's give everybody the proper context here. Early on in 1998, Lex is still at the center of the feud with the NWO, but we've started to expand the roster because thunder is now going to be a reality. So let's take a look at where the baby faces are. We've got sting. Of course, Bret Hart has just come in. He hasn't yet wrestled. Uh, Lex Luger, who, uh, along with Singh, are the two guys who have beaten Hollywood Hogan, uh, the giant diamond Dallas page is getting hotter and hotter by the day, Roddy Piper. And then we're going to enjoy the rise of Goldberg through 1998. But man, just take a look at that crew again, sting, Bret Hart, Lex Luger, the giant DDP, Roddy Piper, Goldberg. I know people would say the NWO got too crowded and there were too many stars and it was lopsided. I would take a look at this and say, uh, no, it's not. Those are seven WrestleMania main event level performers. I mean, just an all-star cast and crew, a hall of famers. You're loaded for bear at the babyface position. We were, which is a great, great spot to be in, especially if you're, 
you've got a heel champion. Yes. And you're, and you're running with that formula. And now you've got, and that was kind of the goal all along is to have that dominant heel as often as we could, not consistently. I want to make sure I'm clear about that. It's not like I think, you know, you should have a heel as your champion forever. Although maybe, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> it's WWE is proving that that's a formula that's working pretty well, but you can't do that. You can't have a, a great heel. If you don't have a pretty deep roster of baby faces, and we certainly did it by this point, there is a trick to it though. And, and I want to know if you have any best practices or you can offer any advice. I mean, one of the criticisms, and I'm not trying to have a conversation about current stuff. Lord knows we did plenty of that last week, but there's been a lot of criticism about the size of the AEW roster and that there's not enough time to focus and feature on all these folks. I just listed just a who's who of baby faces. And that's just one side of the equation. Is it hard to not only get everyone on TV, but give everyone a chance to get over and stay over because it seems awfully crowded. I mean, you've got so many legendary talents here. Now we know that a DDP wasn't quite yet there, but he's on the way. Goldberg's not quite yet there, but he's on the way. But man, Brett and Sting and Lex and Roddy Piper, these are just icons at this point. Is that tough to juggle? Certainly is. Certainly is. It's it's tough creatively because in order, you know, in for someone to get over, I don't I can't think of a better way to say it or I would, but for someone to really uh, increase their overall value to the company and get over with the audience. It, number one, it takes a lot of time, not only in terms of a timeline, but in terms of television time. You know, it you can't just go out there and have great matches and give somebody wins and call that getting a talent over. It has to be story. It has to be character. They've got to get enough mic time and be good at it. Um, so you've got a television time issue and you've got a timeline issue. And yes, it is definitely challenging, particularly when you got Hogan. The Hogan wasn't doing house shows. Hogan had limited pay-per-view dates. So Hogan fell into and intentionally that was from the very first day that he started in WCW. The idea was to keep Hulk Hogan an attraction four times a year, five, maybe six times a year in pay-per-view. Wasn't doing house shows. He wasn't a part of the regular roster. He was an attraction much like undertaker was towards the end of his career. Mm -hmm. Um, Roddy Piper kind of in that same category. There wasn't so much the limits on dates, but Roddy, you know, Roddy had issues. Roddy wasn't going to go out and hit the road and drive around and fly around and, you know, bump in the ring. He had, he had a challenge. So we had to work around Roddy's condition at that time and, and keep him special. Some of them, you know, Hogan as an attraction made absolute sense. Piper as an attraction made absolute sense. Everybody knew who they were. Everybody understood their characters. Even if Roddy were to you know, shift gears in the middle of a week, people knew enough about Roddy that they could immediately identify with Roddy as a, as a baby face or as a heel. So the, they didn't require a tremendous amount of story to take advantage of their character because the audience was already with, them. they knew them so well, but you know, so you got to kind of take Sting out of that mix. You got to take Hogan out of that mix. Excuse me. You got to take Pipe out of that mix and Hogan out of that mix as far as being regular performers and recognize that they're attractions. I argue that although we didn't do this, we should have done this. I think the giant should have been an attraction. The, the, the less you see of Hogan, this is going to sound like a shot and it's not, it's actually a compliment, but the less you see of a Hulk Hogan and on a regular basis, the less you see of Roddy Piper, Less you see a giant for different reasons, the more valuable they become. And again, because they just didn't need to get over, they were already over. Giant, because he's the he was the giant because of his size and his unique attributes, everything that he brought with him through the curtain. That was a less is more type of a character, and I think that's proven to be true with Giant. He needs, he's a specialty attraction. It's like Andre, the giant was a specialty attraction. So even though we had a really crowded roster of baby faces, it was mitigated by the fact that some of them were just part-time and one of them probably should have been. 
we should talk about, um, one of the necessary evils of having this many top over baby faces. And Bruce says it all the time on his podcast. You can't be on top all the time. You got to move up and down the card. That's certainly the case for Luger here. Just a few months ago. Go ahead. And I'm sorry. And that's the point I wanted to make. The difference is Lex. What stood out to me about Lex is that he, his gear, when he shifted into a gear and he knew he was going to wrestle and he had a match, whatever, it didn't matter if you were downshifting him and, and ask him to put somebody over, or if you were putting him in fifth gear and, and, and putting them pedal to the metal with him, he was equally as enthusiastic about either situations. And that's a very valuable asset in and of itself. When you've got somebody that you know is going to draw, you know is going to get attention, you know you can plug them into a story, you know you're going to get what you want out of them, but you can also just, you know, as again, utility player is not the right way to say it, but he, being a great and versatile, mentally and physically and, and technically, being as versatile as Lex was, I think made him one of the more valuable talents on the roster in that respect. Let's uh, remind everybody that he's just a few months removed from beating Hulk Hogan in the main event for the world title. And then main eventing a pay-per-view just five days later. And now he's working with buff Bagwell and Scott Norton. Nothing wrong with that. Great competitors, but it's not Hulk Hogan. It's not the world title. It's not the main event to your point. Luger could do it all. And he was ready for the occasion. And if you want to be ready. Man, can I recommend Blue Chew? You see, Blue Chew isn't just for guys who have a problem. Blue Chew is for guys who want to get a five-star rating. They want to be a 60-minute man. They want to put smiles on people's faces. And remember the days when you were always ready to go? Then, now, forever with Blue Chew. Listen up. It's BlueChew.com. You did it in your bloodline. Seriously. You go ahead and give your wife the American Nightmare. And you know, she might rename your gimmick, the beast incarnate. Here we go. Blue chew is the unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take these dudes anytime day or night. So you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. And Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com, chew it, and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code 83 weeks at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is 83 weeks and you'll receive your first month for free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast and Eric's wiener. I understood when he said at the beginning of this show that he spent the weekend in Deadwood. Well, there was no Deadwood when Eric was there. They renamed it Rock Hard Jones. And then oh uh, check it out right now. Bluechew.com. Use the promo code 83 weeks. No more deadwood around here. Cocksuckers. How did I that, do Eric? That, that, that <laughs> the best podcast read I have ever heard. I don't Joe Rogan, whoever <laughs> that my friend was classic. That was great. Hey, serious business. Blue Chew really works. Uh, Eric and I have both used it. Highly recommend it. Uh, I understand that uh, some guys think that this is associated with erectile dysfunction. Yes, it can help you with that, but it's not just for that. Uh, it, it's um, it's going to enhance, right? It's a PED for your gimmick. Uh, you will be happier. Your partner will be happier. Get the old hot tag for your wiener. Try some Blue Chew. Use the promo code 83 weeks. Uh, the first pay-per-view of 1998, Eric sold out. What a big show this is. Lex and Savage are in the main event. And that is even going on after flair and Brett, which I have to admit as a fan at the time, I thought was the real main event. And yes, I was a flair fan. Uh, but I didn't have the association I do now, 
but the story for flair and Brett just felt more substantial. You know, the story that these guys were both world champs on the other channel. And it was Brett who beat flair to become world champion the first time. And flair saying, why don't you say that thing? You always say the best there is the best there was the best there ever will be great promos and a great match, but it doesn't go on last Lex and Savage do what's the thinking there. I mean, I love Lex and Savage. I'm just wondering why you guys chose that as the main event. Is it because Hogan was loosely involved because of Savage? No, 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 no. I think there there was a period of time and struggling because I want to put this in context. I, I never take that back. I was committed to try to change the perception that a main event is the most important thing. My goal was to have two co-main events. Ideally, I would have what could have been a main event opening up a pay-per-view in terms of the reaction to it. And I, we didn't do it every single time. But if, if you go back and you look at the pay-per-view and the pattern of the booking, and Kevin Sullivan you know, was instrumental in all of this. I certainly had a lot of influence. But the idea was start hot, bang them in the middle, and finish up as strong as you can. And to me, the idea of a co-main event was the, the way to go at that time, particularly when you've got a roster like we had. It the, the audience, I don't think we did it consistently enough. We didn't get it over. We didn't communicate that branding philosophy, if you will, to the extent that we could have and should have. So in terms of the reason why it was Savage and Flair or Savage and, and Luger instead of Flair and Brett. I, I maybe we flipped a coin. I don't know. I don't think that there was a lot of, well, I don't know. Should we do this or should we do oh how you know, it wasn't that. It was okay, we're gonna have a co-main event. I can't tell you the reason why we didn't flip them because you could have flipped the coin. Right. And I agree with you though. I think the the, the where we missed the boat, frankly with Flair and, and Brett is that there was a much richer story to be told there. Yes. In retrospect, I would have put more time into that story than perhaps we did with Savage and Luger. Now, clearly the NWO thing was a big part of that because that was still the money, right? It was still the money. And therefore, I guess, probably the reason why it ended up where it ended up because the NWO and that story was what was printing money for us at that time. Um, but man, there would have been a much better story to tell between Brett and, and flair. I want to talk to you about the NWO. Um, but first I want to mention that it's reported that Randy was upset having to follow flair and Hart because they ran long. And now he's going to wind up having to cut several minutes out of his match. This is what we were talking about just a few moments ago. When you've got this many folks at the top of the card who are this over, if you will, there's no way to not have, I mean, you can't keep all the people happy all the time. That's impossible, right? Yeah. But I, if Randy did react and maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I'll, I'll take it at face value. Cause it sounds like something Randy would get hot about. And by the way, so would everybody else. If you're in a main event, if you've been building that story for weeks, maybe months, in this case, it's an NWO story. Arguably it's been two years now, almost a year and a half. Um, you, you're, you're, you're going to be upset. If you've got an eight, especially a guy like Randy, right? Because Randy was meticulous about laying out his match. His story was laid out either on paper or in his head in finite detail. And to have to edit that story and rewrite that script or that match, whether it's in your head or on paper, while you're standing in gorilla waiting to go out and realizing that now you're five minutes short or six minutes short, anybody gets upset about that. Anybody would, whether you're in the main event, whether you're fl following Flair and Brett, or whether you're following two brand new talents. doesn't matter. You're basically rewriting your movie while you're getting ready to take it to the theater and show it. 
And that's frustrating for anybody. Add to that, that, you know, Randy was wound pretty tight. And the day of the event, the closer you got to the matches, the more tightly he became wound. So when something like that were, were to ha- happen, yeah, Randy, I imagine he would have been very upset. But it's not because it was Flair or Hogan. It could have been or Flair and um, Brett. It could have been anybody. Yeah. Randy would have gotten hot. He's uh, probably upset because it's the main event of the pay-per-view and the match only gets seven minutes and seven seconds. And the show's going to end with Luger racking Nash and Sting having Hogan and the Scorpion. Of course, uh, Lex gets the win here though. And, um, of course, lots of, lots of storyline, lots of NWO Gaga. I wanted to talk to you about the NWO though, because, you know, I recently did an ask Conrad for adfreeshows.com as you and I are recording this. I did it last night and somehow we had a power outage on my block. I did it from the office and we had a power outage on the block. Like not only did we lose power to our building, but all the red lights around us. I mean, it was crazy. Anyway, before that happened, maybe sting was there. I didn't stick around. I got out of there fast. Um, I wanted to ask about the NWO because you know, it feels like when, when Vince enjoyed his greatest success with the WWF. Uh, it was largely built on the back of Hulk Hogan. And when they tried other stuff, they tried it with Savage, uh, on top, didn't work as well. We tried it with, uh, warrior on top. Didn't work as well. We tried it with bread on top. It didn't work as well. We teased the Lex Luger thing. It didn't feel like it was catching any momentum. And then we went back after even the Yokozuna experiment, we went back to Hogan because I feel like oftentimes in business. If you're not sure what to do, you go with the proven tried and true method. Well, this always works. We got to do that. And, and I heard Michael Hayes, uh, well, I had a conversation with him once about the territory days and he said, you know, when you get it white hot, that's when you leave. And I thought, well, that didn't make logical business sense. Why would you do that? Like you, you, you try to squeeze all of that out. You can, and then come up with another idea. And he says, no, if you leave on top, you can always come back. And I understood that approach from a territory wrestling standpoint. And I almost wondered, did WCW fall into the same trap that maybe Vince did of the things that made nitro so successful were the innovations and the new ideas. But once you have a hit and let's be clear, the biggest hit ever at that point in wrestling a game changing hit. It's got to be hard to pull the plug on that or deviate. It feels like, well, we just need to double down on this. This always works, but does that reliance on that impede you trying to go out and innovate and create new stuff? What's your, have you thought about that before that maybe we should have had a definitive stop to the NWO while it's still hot? Let it go away for a bit. And then it could come back in a couple of years and still be hot again. That's hard to do when the money printer's going off though. So you're sort of, there's not a tried and true surefire answer. It's just opinion. You tried it one way. Would it have worked another way? Do you think in hindsight? Absolutely. And, and, and you're right. It was because at the end of it all, what was my job? My job as an employee, Turner Broadcasting, was to deliver the bottom line. Right. That was my job and and get ratings for the network. And once I found that formula, I became a victim, in, in a sense, of my own success. WCW became a victim of our own success for the very reason that you just pointed out. And it is a tough spot because subconsciously, and and there's pressure from the outside as well. You know, it's not like, you know, Kevin Sullivan didn't have people coming to him and, you know, talking about way we got, we got to get some of the younger talent over or some of these fresher talents over. Um, I certainly had that. So you, and, and, and you know, it. it's not like, Oh, shucks. I should have thought of that. You know, it's not that it's that, you know, you got your eye on the big ball, so to speak. And you also know that you should be doing some other things along the way that you recognize you're not, but it's okay because you're, you're delivering in some cases over delivering in in, in any other category. And I, I did, I I became a victim of it. 
I did. And, and in hindsight, and I like what Michael said. And, you know, that's why I think Michael Hayes is probably, you know, he doesn't get, nobody talks much about Michael Hayes. He's not in the news. He doesn't do social media for the most part. Uh, but in terms of a mind, not so much that Michael is going to come up with the greatest creative story, although he's capable of it and certainly has, but that's not his greatest value. Michael Hayes' greatest value is kind of a macro view of strategy, creative strategy, not a creative idea. This guy should wrestle this guy and this should be the finish. That's an idea or a story. But in terms of the best way to manage creative, Michael shines at that, man. I, a brief period of time that I was in WWE in 2019, and we'd have these production meetings, which I won't even go into it in too much detail. But because of the nature of the way things were done back then, and Vince being Vince and willing to tear up a script on a moment's notice and start from scratch the day of, you know, anytime a discussion came up and you'd have producers, you'd have you know, production people, you'd have match producers, you'd have announcers, you'd have 60 people in these production meetings or whatever, 40, 50, 60 people seemed like a, an arena full sometimes. And then when there became a question about, you know, what we're going to do that night in the story or a finish, Michael Hayes would always sit in the back of the room. He never wanted to sit up front always like as far back as you could possibly get. Now it's not like you couldn't see him because he dressed like yes. he was in a remake of the, sh of, of shaft. If you remember that movie, you probably don't. Oh, I time, remember. But, yeah. Shut, uh, okay. shut your mouth. He's a bad motherfucker. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Yeah. Michael Hayes would always dress like that. So you, you, you knew he was there, but he's always in the back of the room. But the, the person that Vince reacted to most of the time when there was an issue that had to be figured out creatively in terms of a match or finish or whatever, an angle seven times out of 10, it's Michael Hayes. Mm. He, he just, and it's cause he'd sit back and he'd listen and, and he had this reservoir of experience and understanding of psychology and storytelling so that he just sat back, Kept his mouth shut. Didn't, didn't ever raise. Well, he'd only raise his hand if he had an answer to a question, but he would sit back and picture it in his head and he'd come up with a solution. And I think Michael Hayes' comment to you about the old territories and leave when you're white hot applies and could, certainly would have, it could have applied to WCW 98 in the NWO story. And I th did ride it too long. We know that, you know, we, we rode that horse until it died and it was unfortunate because it could have been much bigger and much better. Let that be a lesson to you. Uh, sometimes it's okay to, uh, leave well, them wanting more, leave them wanting more. That's exactly right. Uh, so Lex Luger is, um, now sort of in the background a bit, and he's going to be spending a lot of time working with Scott Hall, but Scott's really focused on the Larry Zabisco story. Sting and Hogan are still continuing their whole, who's the real champ story. And randomly Savage is still attacking Luger to continue what's going on the night before. Eventually Luger would come out and challenge Savage who jumps in from behind. And then sting comes out and, uh, he attacks Savage gives him the scorpion death drop. And now the NWO come out and a net drops from the ceiling on Luger. So it's sting and Savage and the NWO destroying and then injuring sting. But yeah, a net from the ceiling. This is a little silly. Uh, but yeah, when you said that with the words, when the words hit my ears and kind of worked them way into my brain, I went, Ooh. it's like Batman from the sixties. Kind of damn. We could have come up with something better than that. Well, it's I all know. to set up a, we'll a, drop a net because we do that. There's nets. all over. <laughs> Super brawl is a rematch Lex and Randy Savage. They got seven minutes and seven seconds in January and February in a no DQ match. They get seven minutes and 26 seconds. Logan's going to show up with his ribs all taped up because he was injured from being, uh, attacked on Thursday and, uh, to sell the deal even more Luger goes for a press slam pretty early, but his ribs give out and he drops Savage and starts selling. 
And the fans here at the cow palace are firmly behind Randy Savage and they're chanting Luger sucks. And Meltzer would say perhaps the biggest pop of the entire show came when Luger racked Savage and Elizabeth did a run in to rake Luger's eyes. That brings down what Meltzer would call the NWO B team, Bagwell, Vincent, Norton, and Brian Adams. They all do a run in, but Luger and Savage team together to fight them off. And the bell rings, which makes no sense because it's a no DQ match. And then Hogan shows up and, uh, Luger once again, racks Savage. Hogan tells the NWO not to interfere and that he wanted to see Savage get beat. Savage submits. And now the bell rings a second time. Well, there with never an explanation as to why it rang the first time. So listen, yeah, let me, let's separate it. I mean, that's again, that's a tapeworm being a tapeworm, but when there's interference, when there's people running, when, when chaos breaks out, how many hundreds, maybe thousands of times, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. It's not to signify a finish, right? As the tapeworm were to imply here or to, you know, to, to, fill the space on his dirt sheet happens all the time, folks. It's not always a finish that causes the belt to rip. could be chaos. It is chaos, but Luger gets the win and, uh, he's going to be programmed with a now heel Scott Steiner, and they're going to face off at uncensored. They don't get a ton of time under four minutes. And Meltzer would say it makes no sense. Steiner had just turned heel and threatened to get hot and the ability to step up and rank. And instead they cut his legs off in his first major, major singles match. Of course, this is because Lex Luger gets the win. Of course, Rick Steiner's involved. So there's lots of story here, but again, it's more about Rick and Scott and less about Lex. Is that maybe the, the, the curse of being a good soldier? Like if you're a guy who can be counted on to be the top guy or the middle of the card guy, and we need you to win or lose or whatever, uh, we can sort of put you anywhere and it'll still work. So you don't have to be the priority. You can instead help us get these other guys over it. Cause it feels like Luger has kind of been a backdrop for a lot of this. And I'm sure he was a, a great guy to work with, but is that a curse to be so amenable at times? Is it a curse to be a team player? No. Is is it a curse to be making the amount of money that Lex was making because I was so happy with the ability to to use him in the role that we were using him? Absolutely not. Was it a curse to help get a lot of talent over, some of whom were pretty good friends of yours? Yeah. The answer to that is no. It can look that way, and I'm sure at times, because we're all human, you know, I, I would imagine, I never talked to Lex about it, but I would imagine there were probably times, especially when he was as hot as he was, because you, as you pointed out, you know, Lex was like almost the guy for the biggest part of his career. Right. Right. I mean, he, and you know, he was, he was always in that upper echelon, but he was not very often the guy. And after what happened in WWE in particular, and I think even in WCW before that, I think Lex's determination was to be as much the best team player there was on the roster. And I don't think he felt it was a curse, but I'm sure there were times when we went, damn, what are they doing? I'm actually hot. I'm actually capable of doing this and carrying this. Sure, that happened, but I, it never manifested in terms of the way he conducted business or communicated. Let's, uh, let's talk about what's next for spring stampede. It's going to be Lex teaming up with his old pal, Rick Steiner to take on Scott Steiner and buff Bagwell. Lex and Rick are going to get the win after Scott is chased to the back and Luger racks buff. Uh, and this is where it starts to feel like things drop off a little bit for Lex in 98. He moves down the card. He's going to be the second match on the show at Slamboree. He's going to take on Brian Adams. Who's just jumped to the company earlier this same year. Beats him in about five minutes with the torture rack. Uh, and then finally he gets a shot in the arm in 1998 when he joins the NWO Wolfpack. He's going to save Kevin Nash from the giant Vincent and Brian Adams of the original NWO. Uh, talk to me about, you know, Lex Luger has always been from day one, a, a guy waving the WCW flag and banner, but now he's going to don the red and black. Why did it make sense for uh, Lex to be a member of the Wolfpack to you? I think it was time to change his character. You know, it was time to add a layer to his character. It was time to give us more options 
because he's got a new character, a new perspective. And he, he, sometimes you just got to make that change. And I think with Lex, it was time to make that change. The pop is gigantic and the announcers are asking what will sting think? Uh, and of course, fans who've been watching the program know that sting and Lex Luger have been best of friends and former tag team champions throughout their entire time in WCW. Um, and later that night, sting Texas uh, teams up with Lex Luger in a tag match against the giant and NWO sting and the baby faces get the win here when sting pins NWO sting clean. And the Wolfpack celebrates and they hand sting a shirt, but the show goes off the air without a decision. That is a trademark of nitro back in the day, a cliffhanger. Is that uh, important for Eric Bischoff or is it a priority for Kevin Sullivan or both? Both. We, I mean, cliffhangers, name me an episodic series. I mean, I watched, uh, episode nine, season four of succession last night. You seen it? I've seen, I, I'm completely caught up as you and I are recording this. The season finale, uh, is this weekend as folks are listening to this. It was last night, not just season finale, but series finale. I love it. I think this season of succession might be the best single season of any TV show I've ever seen. I think it's the best television I've ever seen period bar none. Wow. I, I, the, the funeral scene, the funeral service scene. Yes. Was amazing from, from a, a Lighting perspective, that script was amazing. Yes. From a performance, if there's not at least two or three Emmys coming out of that episode. Yeah, they're going to rack up. Then they should just forget about Emmys. Even the writing, the performance, the directing, you know, not to get too far into that scene because not everybody cares, but there was a shot there when Roman you know, Roman collapsed. He couldn't go up and do what he was going to do and give the eulogy. So his brother came up and did it following their uncle going up and absolutely just burying, so to speak, their father who was sitting in a casket and you thought it was all over with. And you kind of went with the, the uncle and his, his dialogue, you kind of understood it. And I remember watching that last night with Lori. It's like, Oh man, there's an Emmy right there. That, that performance was unbelievable. And then boom, here comes another one. And it was even better. The writing, the performance, the direction, the, the camera shots that they chose during that were phenomenal. And even the photography, you know, the, the funeral procession, once they left the church and he went into the cemetery was shot like news. Mm-hmm. It, it was ENG style, electronic news gathering, you know, it's like jittery and the, even the film that they used was used to create the feeling that you're watching a newscast and not a, a very expensive television series. Everything about that show was some of the best television I've ever seen, but it's always a cliffhanger. Yes. That's what drives episodic television. Yes. And I, I doubled down, tripled down any time that I could on that. And it was largely why WCW and Nitro became as there were other reasons, but largely because of the way we treated the end of the show. It was more about forcing people to tune in next week than it was sending them home happy. That's what pay-per-views are for generally, but TV was designed to get them to the pay-per-view and the cliffhanger formula works so great. It was a staple and it did work, uh, on thunder. Just a few days after nitro Luger's going to cut a promo saying he joined the wolf pack because quote, it felt right to him and he didn't turn his back on WCW and he still respects them. And you know, listen, Kevin Nash and Conan, who are the other guys here in the wolf pack, they're cool. This speech of, I didn't turn my back and I still respect them comes off less cool. I mean, no arguing that Lex has maybe the coolest look in wrestling, but just the content of the character, the promo, it feels a little square compared to the presentation of Kevin Nash and Conan. Did you think maybe adding him to this group could then just by default make Lex the perception of Lex a little cooler? You know, I don't think I thought of it like cooler, Yeah, but 
I, certainly adding that that edge. Yes, that, there you go. Particularly Conan. Yes. Um, had and and Lex, or excuse me, and Kevin to a degree, but Conan was like was like the epicenter of cool shit, right? A lot of guys spun off of Conan, and I certainly thought it would give Lex more of an edge. And without question, the way you characterized that promo was at the very to be as kind as I could be was really soft. That it needed an edge to it. Not a, well, I'm just coming over here because I like these guys and I still love you guys too, but I'm going to go hang out over here because they have better food. I don't know. Yeah, there should have been a motivation and there, there has to be a why. It's kind of like we have talked about a lot. Why is like the, the most important question that you should create in people's minds? Why did Luger do this? And if you can't, if you don't have a good why of it, then the how of it doesn't really matter so much. You have to start with a good why in order for the how and the when to kind of all fit together and make a good story. On Nitro, it's going to be Lex Luger teaming up with Kevin Nash to take on Hogan and the Giant. It's the first big battle of the two NWOs. Uh, and it's going to be Luger and Nash getting a win by DQ when Hogan hits Nash with the world title. And Luger's going to wear black jeans in the ring, which is maybe the first time we've seen Lex do something like this. I mean, he was known for a certain look of the, the black or blue trunks before that and the boots and, and that's it. And now we got a little bit of an edge here. So he's trying some new stuff. Sting is going to body slam the giant. He's going to try to rip off his black and white NWO shirt. And uh, the place goes nuts as the NWO wolf pack is celebrating the, the moment here with sting before they go off the air. I mean, anytime sting came down, uh, from the, the ceiling like this, it was a home run and the fans just went bananas for it. So for him to do that, take the trench coat off, reveal the NWO black and white shirt. And you think, oh man, he's with those guys. And then turns and body slams the giant. This is great. This is a great nitro moment and maybe a, a an overlooked moment. The idea that Sting did the NWOTs and nope, he's with the Wolf Pack. What do you remember about the execution here? I mean, this is an electric moment. Yeah, that was again a lot of Kevin Sullivan in there and a lot of collaboration. You know, I didn't lay out finishes. That wasn't my deal. Couldn't probably still to this day. It's not my forte. But it was Kevin Sullivan's. The reason we brought Kevin Sullivan in originally is because he knew how to get heat and Kevin kind of evolved with the, 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 the strategy, the cliffhanger strategy on television payoff on pay-per-view this, this smacks of Kevin Sullivan and a lot of probably a couple others in there as well, collaborating, but I, I just hear it. He laid out fucking awesome. It is awesome, but it is a little confusing. I mean, just to remind everybody mm -hmm. sting, just body slammed the giant. He teased that he was joining the NWO with the giant, the black and white and body slams him, but they're the tag team champions. So sting is a member of the wolf pack giant is the member of NWO Hollywood and they're the tag team champions. That's an, that's an interesting story. And I just, got, vert I just got vertigo. <laughs> JJ Dillon, uh, has, uh, has decided to make this a thing. And he says that the giant has no right to defend the, the tag titles on his own. So there's going to be a singles match at great American bash to determine the new tag team champions. Singles eh. match. Eh. <laughs> yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's just, it was a miss with, man, sure. did you see him miss that one? Wow. You know, here's the thing. Uh, if I've learned nothing else from Jeff Jarrett, I've learned the phrase and he used it last week when me and you were hooting and hollering at each other. Creative is subjective, but I'll tell you what's <laughs> not subjective. Getting a good night's sleep is important and I am sleeping better than ever. Thanks to sleep me. Let me tell you about sleep me sleep systems. Are you somebody who needs extra recovery from that last workout? Or maybe you're like me and you just sleep hot in general. Well, you don't need to suffer or wake up tired or wake up sore. Sleep Me's award-winning sleep systems can hook you up. 
This is a mattress topper that goes on top of your current mattress. You do not need to buy a new mattress. It uses water's thermal powers to cool your bed as low as 55 degrees. That means no matter how hot you get, you can sleep at your ideal temperature. Sleep Me makes customizable climate controlled sleep solutions that help you improve your entire well being. The sleep systems work on all types of beds, even adjustable ones. Worried because your partner likes to sleep at a different temperature at night? Well, that's no sweat here. They offer configurations to allow dual temperature control that can range from 55 degrees to 115 degrees. And even if you don't like the idea of getting into a cold bed, you can schedule temperature changes. You start the night in a cozy bed and your pre-programmed sleep system will automatically cool you down once you're asleep. My wife's side of the bed does that every single night. She wants to climb into a warm bed, but she doesn't want to get all hot and sweaty. So it'll cool her off as she's sleeping and then warm her up to wake her up. It's automated. She said at one time and she's done. Currently sleep me has two different water-based sleep systems, the doc pro and the cube. Both sleep systems provide mattress toppers that cool as low as 55 degrees. The doc pro is the newest, most powerful system for a perfect sleep climate. No matter your body's heat load or the room temperature. So if you need better athletic recovery or you're suffering from hot, uncomfortable sleep, man, you just got to check out sleep me at sleep.me slash 83 weeks. That's sleep.me slash 83 weeks. Plus as a listener of this podcast, you'll save up to 20% on the sleep system when you use the promo code 83 weeks. This really is a game changer. You need to check it out right now at sleep.me slash 83 weeks and save up to 20% using the promo code 83 weeks. Of course you spell 83 weeks, eight, three W E E K S that's sleep.me slash 83 weeks. Eric, prior to sleep me, man, I was sleeping five or six hours a night. Uh, I would toss and turn. I'd be up and down. I was fighting with the covers, trying to get comfortable and cool. I used to kick one leg out from underneath the covers because I would get hot and I felt like that regulated my temperature. I would flip my pillow trying to find Stuart Scott used to call it on ESPN, the cooler than the other side of the pillow. I did that all night trying to get cool. I don't do that anymore. And now I found that I get deeper, more restorative REM sleep. And I didn't even really know what that was until I realized, Hey, I had a dream last night that I remember <laughs> very well. Like I hadn't dreamed in a long time. And I know that sounds crazy, but I'm colorblind and I have bright, vivid, colorful dreams. Like I'm seeing stuff that I don't normally see. And it's all because I'm getting the proper sleep. My body needs sleep. Me is the real deal. I know you've got one and this time of year, as it starts to warm up, it really comes in handy for you and Mrs. B, right? It absolutely does. Um, I've noticed now for the last couple of months, I've spent a lot of time stretching. It's something that when I was in martial arts, of course, you know, I stretched religiously for hours a day. Um, but as I've gotten older and gotten away from being physically active and all that, everything is kind of tightened up. And I just recently started in the last month or so, started really stretching a lot, pretty aggressively to the point where, you know, my back starts getting stiff and it's a good, it's like working out, you know, yeah. it's not a bad stiff. It's just stiff from, from really straining the muscles. But what I've found is that like anything else, you know, when you get it, when you work out or you got your, uh, not enough muscles in your back, your neck, what do you do? You put ice on it, right? Cool it off because the cooler it is uh, on your skin, you get more circulation, right? And that makes you feel better. It loosens you up. Same thing is true with sleep me. You sleep at 55 degrees or 60 degrees and it's cool. You wake up in the morning and you're not nearly as stiff. If you've been working out or you're on a hard walk or a hard run or whatever it may be, or you just not working in the yard, mowing a lawn, which you can start doing here shortly. Um, yeah, sleep me can really help you if, if you're working out or you just have sore muscles. You'll feel much better when you wake up. You'll not only sleep better and have great colorful dreams like Conrad Thompson, even if you are colorblind, but if you've been working out or mowing a lawn too much or throwing logs around or whatever it is you do, riding horse. Oh, I did that too. I went horseback riding for the first time in about three years. <laughs> Could I feel that in my lower back? But again, a couple nights sleep on a sleep meet, get that circulation going. Good as new. Sleep.me forward slash 83 weeks. Be sure to use that promo code 83 weeks. Uh, so Lex Luger has become like the unofficial recruiter, I guess, if you will, for the Wolfpack. He 
he got sting to join and now he's offered it to DDP. We know DDP never actually takes the call and joins. Uh, but Lex only does a run in at great American bash and he's not on nitro, but he is given a mic on thunder after great American bash. And the man goes off. Here's the write up from the observer. Conan and Lex Luger came out. Luger then cut a promo that was laced with real life animosity towards Hollywood Hogan. He said, there are wrestlers who aren't on the show that week who think they carry a cell phone and a pager, but there, it makes them a big deal. That doesn't cut it. If you love something, you let them know about it. He told Hogan, he's a star because the fans decided you were a star. He said a guy who doesn't try to be a big star, but the fans know is a star is Goldberg. While you were off filming your last movie, guys got together and that doesn't sit well with you. You'll try to divide us, swerving us behind closed doors with Eric Bischoff to shut down the red and black. Well, there's a new power source in town and the fans have decided we are it. You can have parties and basketball players and limos, and you can then try to embarrass us, but it won't work. You once said that all the little dogs wrestle while you're off doing movies. Well, now we've grown up. And we're not just the big dogs, we're wolves. And Tony Schiavone on commentary says that a lot of what Lex is saying here rings true. A great interview from Lex. And I like that it blurs the lines of, Hey, was he supposed to say that? Hey, is that inside baseball? Like if we can suspend our disbelief and say, okay, I know that that was whatever, but now this, this was real. That's the stuff that really works. And people still talk about all these years later. And this is a great promo from Lex that really stands the test of time. May have been Lex Luger's best promo ever. Maybe. And, but, 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 to, but to clear something up, because right off the bat, it started out with bullshit. It, it, there it's was a, no personal animosity. It's a promo. Real life, personal animosity. Yeah. That was the tapeworm being the tapeworm. Lex had a lot of respect. And I think affection for, for, for Hulk, they were pretty good friends. So there was no personal animosity, but there was a great promo that, as you pointed out, so, so well blurred the lines. Was that real? Obviously one of the biggest, I don't very rarely use the word, but marks in, in the periphery of the industry is Dave Meltzer because he bought into it. He bought into it and it was because it rang true to so many fans, right? It's what the fans were feeling. And Lex was articulating that and made a great story. It made a great promo. It was excellent. Excellent. Let's talk about what's next on thunder. It's announced that Kevin Nash wasn't there. And considering he's now a tag team champion with sting and sting has the title defense tonight. Lex Luger will now be his partner. The decision to make Sting and Nash tag champions has always been a little confusing. I mean, you're right here in the middle of this Wolfpack push. Nash is really the main member of the group. Lex isn't doing much. Why not just make Sting and Luger the tag champions as we've done before? If Nash I isn't. Never, I've never done that. Yeah. I wanted something different. I've never done that. I Got mean, it. you can only go to that well so many times and expect to get a positive reaction. It's not moving anything forward. It's going back. They, um, they team together for a few weeks, Sting and Luger, uh, wrestling guys and, and picking up wins against guys like the giant Brian Adams and, um, uh, the anvil and the British bulldog. And it's reported in the observer that there's talk of having them defend the titles against Scott Hall and disciple. Thankfully we don't get that. Um, it's kind of wild though, that that's really the only appearance, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Conan versus disco inferno. And that's the only appearance for the wolf pack on that pay-per-view. And we talked about it at the top of the show. You have so much talent. It's probably hard to just find a spot for everybody on the show. I mean, I've busted your balls on the program before, but Hey, why wasn't bread on this? And when you really make a list of how heavy the talent roster is just with the top of the baby faces. And oh, by the way, we got a hundred cruiserweights and all these tag teams and really great performers like Booker T and Chris Benoit. It's easy to get lost in the shuffle here and it can't be, everybody can't be on every card. That's just the reality with a roster this size. No, yeah, absolutely. And also <clears throat> you can't have 
essentially the same story or derivatives of right you know, on every single pay-per-view in every single match on every single paper. You have to give the audience a break too. I mean, going back to leave them wanting more, you know, this wasn't that, I mean, it wasn't like, okay, let's leave all this stuff off because we want the audience to want it, but you have to give it a break and you have to make room for something. You got to let a story breathe too. Right. You can't just pound it down their throat every single week, which we had been doing for a year and a half. Uh, Goldberg is obviously going to become the world champion, uh, and, and he's just going to start running through people with Goldberg as a baby face. I guess there's never going to be a program with him and Lex. Do you think in a different time, a different place that could have worked with all due respect, because I, I have a, an enormous amount of respect and, and I really, really, uh, like Lex Luger a lot and Bill. But that would have been, if they would have put the time into it, if we would have put the time into it, let it build, not overexpose them on the way there. Because again, Bill, this is not a knock. It's a reality. Bill had a very limited skill set at this point. There was only so much you could ask him or expect him to be able to do in terms of a match. Um, But even given those limitations, and let's face it, Lex technically, that's, that wasn't Lex Luger's strength, technical wrestling. He wasn't a Bret Hart. He wasn't a Ric Flair. He could work great with those guys, but he wasn't that ring general that could compensate for somebody else's lack of experience the way Ric Flair famously uh, can to this, probably to this day do. Um, same with Randy, Bret, obviously. Um, that would have been a tougher one, but it could have happened. It absolutely could have happened, but it would have taken a lot of care and thought. By the way, speaking of Bill Goldberg, did you see that shot on TMZ of his head busted open the other day? I mean, I don't know if he's uh, headbutting lockers trying to get ready. It's the for first him. thing I thought of was this cat just can't keep banging his I'll keep from ha- banging his head on shit. Hey, it's like he sees a wall, bam! He sees a tree, bam! He sees a limo, bam! Saw it in TMZ before I even read it. Oh, it's Bill being Bill. <laughs> <laughs> that's we, not news. I don't know why that's on TV. That's not news. <laughs> there's a uh, let's sidebar here for a minute. We haven't done anything like this on today's program, but there's a lot of speculation that he wants to do a four city, a self-promoted four city retirement tour. And there's talk that maybe one of those is going to be in Jerusalem and maybe one's in another continent and another, maybe I've heard some stuff I shouldn't share on air, but the point is, I'm curious what you thought of that. Not just a one-off, not just a so-and-so's last match. I mean, who'd ever do something like that, but a four city retirement tour. What do you think of that for Goldberg? Well, I don't know the details of it, so it's hard to really have an opinion. Here's couple scenarios. One scenario is he's working with a established, credible, well-funded tour promoter that can execute on that. If, if that's the case and Bill's got a roster of people that he likes being around that like working with Bill and are anxious to do that tour, I think it could be fantastic, especially going to a place like, you know, I'd like, if I could afford it, I'd fly to Jerusalem to see that match. You know what I mean? That's, mm. that's cool. I like that. Um, again, if he's got the right promoter, if it's really well-funded and they've managed their expectations and he's got the right roster to follow him around the globe, have at it. If you, if it's, if he's doing it, I imagine he's doing it for the fun. He may want to take his son, you know, on that tour, his wife and son, and, and be a part of that one last time. I think it could be really good. I think it can also be a fucking nightmare. I wish and I would, I wouldn't go near it with a 10 foot pole, but that's just me, you know, Bill, again, it all depends on the critical issue is there. Does he have the right promoting partner? I uh, wish him nothing but success him and the promoters. And I would encourage them take a listen to our Hulkamania Australia tour episode that we did not too long ago. Maybe there's some lessons in there. Of- yeah. And, I, and, and again, it, this can be solved with the right promoter. And that's why I said well-funded as well and experienced with the right connections. But 
manage your expectations going into that because you don't have, con- there's so many variables. There's a lot of variables you don't have any control over when you're promoting here in the United States with the company that you've been working with for a long time. There's always variables. There's travel. There's a million things that could go wrong. Injuries, blah, 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 creative issues. But once you step away from that and now you're putting everything in the hands of people that you've never worked with before, just be really, really thorough and be really careful because there's so many variables you have no control over that can go bad in a hurry. Well, we were trying to control some variables here in WCW at road wild. We're going to have a battle Royale with members of the NWO and Goldberg. You know, Hey, he can beat all these guys one at a time. What if there's just a bunch of them? Well, he's one of the last three, he being Lex Luger until he's thrown over, uh, by the giant after taking a spear and the nitro after road wild Luger is going, who was attacked on nitro the week before is going to claim that he saw Scott Hall and Bret Hart attack him before he was knocked unconscious. And now he's challenging Brett to a title match for Brett's U S title. And this is almost one year to the day when Lex beat Hogan for the world title. Now he's wrestling or challenging Brett for the U S title. That's some, that's some rarefied air, man. Like we could say, oh, at times it looks like creative didn't have anything for Lex, but along the way he joins the wolf pack. He has a tag title run. He recruits staying into the NWO and he goes from working Hogan for the world title to Brett to the U S title. Pay no mind to the statue or, or the stature rather of the titles Hogan and Brett. That's pretty big time stuff, man. Don't you think? Yeah. And again, that's the value of having somebody that is, that was as versatile of a character as Lex was. Lex gets the he win over Brett. Yeah. I didn't have Brett. I didn't have Lex cornering me, you know, as we were walking out of the building at night. Hey, what about me? Where's mine? What about me? How, how, none of that. Lex was just, he was there and he could deliver. As you may recall, the story with uh, Lex and Hogan was Lex beat Hogan on a Monday on nitro and then dropped the title, the world title back to Hogan at the pay-per-view on Saturday road. While was on a Saturday. So he had just a handful of days there as world champ at the paper. That sucked. That, that, that was bad. That was bad. I'm angry at myself for allowing that to happen. Lex gets a win over Brett here and wins the U S title in 16 minutes. Uh, he wins with the torture rack. He's only the second man to have five different runs with the U S title behind uh, uh, sharing that honor with Ric Flair. And much like last year with Hogan and the world title, he drops the U S title back to Brett on thunder. So we do it again. Second verse, same as the first. And then on nitro sting and Luger team up in the main event to take on Hollywood Hogan and Brett Hart. Let me say that sentence again, the stalwarts, the franchise baby faces of WCW historically sting and Lex Luger teaming up in the main event of Monday nitro to take on Hollywood Hogan and Bret Hart, arguably the two biggest WWF stars in several years. This is a dream match. It feels like, and it's not on pay-per-view it's on free TV. And why is it on free TV? Well, because the Monday night wars are blessing us with big shit every single week. And boy, does it hit, it does a 6.0 rating. It's the highest nitro rating ever at that point. And let's put into context how big this is. This is head to head with the night after SummerSlam SummerSlam that year with a white hot stone cold, Steve Austin featured him defending his title against a baby face undertaker. And this is the fallout show. The night after a pay-per-view is always tough to compete against and you do it. It's unbelievable. The result is, uh, the, the nitro show is unopposed because that raw show is preempted and you were a victim to these preemptions earlier in the year. When, when they were doing their silly DX invasion and things like that on you guys, 
they had the upper hand because they had the night to themselves because of the NBA playoffs. Well, now it's your turn because tennis and those damn dogs, they were low key <laughs> NWO members. I mean, that's what it was. The result is the overrun on this show is crazy. It does a 9.27 share. It's watched in 4.48 million homes. It's just a crazy number. And think about the talent in there. Sting and Lex Luger, Hulk Hogan, and Bret Hart. I know you and I spend a lot of time talking about like Halloween Havoc 96 and 97 specifically how much fun you were having, but you're reaching new heights in 98, but it does feel as if, uh, the pressure's on. Do you think you did your best work when you had the pressure on and it was going back and forth like this? With the benefit of hindsight, where would you rank 98 amongst the other years? Depends how you look at it. You know, uh, from a strictly business, shameless plug, John Alba and I, strictly business, drops on Thursdays. Check it out wherever you get your favorite podcast. If you subscribe to 83 Weeks, you'll be notified exactly when we drop strictly business. It's free, by the in way. Terms of, in, in terms of strictly business, 98 was was a better year. Ratings wise, 98, at least the first half of it was, was a much, much better year. And you talked about that over and that's over probably about 9 million people. It's crazy. Watch that show. That's a lot. And I don't care how TVs change and where people watch it. You can't compare anything today to that era. And a lot of it is just because the wrestling business was so hot. Is it just because of WCW or WW? It's just the combination the war. Coke versus Pepsi. That's what leveled up the business. So from a business perspective, perspective, I would have to say 98. 96 was more important. 97 was more fun, but 98 was more profitable. The match itself, Sting and Luger against Hogan and Brett goes 11 minutes and 18 seconds. You see Brett and Hogan chatting before the match and they don't look confident. The announcers are speculating that they're just playing head games. At about two and a half minutes, Sting tags in to face Brett, but Brett immediately tags in Hogan and Hogan doesn't look pleased that Brett is refusing essentially to fight Sting at about 10 minutes. Luger's going to hot tag Sting against Hogan. The cycle's going to interfere and, and, and get Hogan the belt. Hogan starts whipping Sting with a belt and Brett steps in and yanks the belt away. Brett then storms out of the ring and walks to the back and Hogan is yelling. What's up with that? And Brett is saying, you gave me your word sort of insinuating that Hogan promised to give sting a fair fight. This is cool. I like this. I wish we would have seen a more proper payoff for Brett and Hogan, but once again, it does feel like Lex is just kind of there, but if you're going to be kind of there, be there for the highest rated main event in nitro history. The focus of the promotion quickly shifts here to the ultimate warrior though. Warrior's going to come back. It's going to be warrior Hogan and everybody sort of takes a back seat to that storyline, including Lex. He's still teaming with sting, but all of a sudden on thunder, Brett teams up with Lex to take on bulldog and Jim Neidhart. And I know we're not talking about Brett, but that feels like that's just really random. I mean, he's wrestling two guys that. He's usually been very closely associated with former tag team partners, if you will, family members and the British bulldog and Jim Neidhart. If we had a, uh, to do over, is there anybody you think you could do a better job with more than Bret Hart in WCW or do I have that way off base? No, I think that's fair. Yeah. I think it's fair. It's a fair criticism as a fair observation. You know, hindsight is. I said, it's definitely 2020 and I wish I would have had a little bit of it. And, and, it, and you know what? That shouldn't have even been hindsight. It was just, you know, the, last week when you and I were going back and forth about, again, not to go off on a tangent, but AEW and their new third show. And I'm pretty vocal. You know, I hope for them works out. My experience has been that it won't. I haven't seen anything that, that suggests otherwise out of that organization. But one of the reasons I feel as strongly as I did is, but because of thunder, because of the issues, some of which I created for myself, I know what it's like not to have creative resources. Because even though we added thunder and it was a lot of time and thought 
energy put into that. We didn't add to the team. We didn't add, we didn't have a well-oiled creative machine that allowed us to say, okay, now we've got another two hours, which is almost like a pay-per-view every week in terms of what goes into figuring out how to pull it off and actually executing it just from a physical perspective, probably putting it up live shows and all that. It's a lot. And I think Bret Hart was in some respects, this is not an excuse because it was my, my responsibility and I'm taking a hundred percent of it, but he, Brett was a victim of timing as well in that we didn't have the creative resources to put into a guy like Brett the way we should have. We didn't prioritize Brett the way we could have. Not that Brett was the most important thing. By the way, I didn't bring him in because I thought he was the second coming of forever. It, it, he needed to be an important part in, in, a, in a kind of like the hood ornament, if you will, or thunder. But man, if we would have given that a lot more thought, it could have been so much better. And I, to a degree, you know, I understand Brett's frustration looking back at that period of his career because he did fall victim to a large degree, just us having too much on our plate. Uh, at fall brawl, we're going to have team WCW take on team NWO Hollywood, take on team NWO Wolfpack in the war games. Maybe it's not the war games of the years past, but there's a lot of star power here. I mean, just the team of WCW is warrior Piper and DDP, but the next night on nitro Lex is taken on Scott hall, but this is the night where we have Scott hall reveal himself to be drunk on camera. He tries mm. to flick his toothpick at Luger and misses you come out and try to get hauled to the back. Nash and Conan are coming out. Everyone's trying to talk to Scott and talk. Uh, Scott has taken a swig from a cup and then throws up on you. Not our best creative and Lex essentially just treads water for a few weeks. He's not even on Halloween havoc and it's reported in the torch that Luger and Elizabeth have developed a close friendship outside of the ring. This is worth mentioning of course, because Savage is still here and he of course, uh, is the now ex-husband of, of Elizabeth, but Lex doesn't have an ex-wife. He has an actual wife. And when it makes the newsletter, I remember thinking. I don't think things like that usually appear in the newsletter. When did you first realize, Hey man, uh, they have a relationship and this might be a mess for me. And people wonder why I feel the way I feel about Meltzer. Well, Just, that was the torch, but yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Keller dirt sheets in general. At this point, Keller was very much like Meltzer at this point. He's said Keller has really changed his strategy quite a bit. And I, I, I check him out. I read him. He's got credibility with me because he's no longer implying the Dave Meltzer formula. But it's one of the reasons I've been so angry and vocal over the years about, and it's been that way with me for decades. Um, I was, look, it wasn't, wasn't a secret. I, I will tell you that both Lex and Liz they didn't rub it in anybody's faces. It was obvious to those of us who knew both of them. My wife was very close to Elizabeth. They were pretty good friends. So was Janie Engel. She was my assistant and she was more than my assistant. She was a part of our family. Um, so yeah, we knew it was obvious, but it wasn't, wasn't in your face. So in people's personal lives, once they step away from the venue, it just don't matter to me. It's right. never been my, I don't judge. You know, judge not, least you be judged. I think that's how the saying goes. <laughs> um, hell of a saying, by the way. And I remind myself every single day to this day, and I certainly did back then. It's just what people do in their personal lives is not for me to judge. And I felt that way about Lex and, and Liz. I was concerned a little bit because there were other things going on just beyond their friendship outside of the ring. But, yeah, we knew well before it was published in a dirt sheet. At World War III, Lex is in a battle royal and uh, it's down to the final seven, along with Nash, Conan, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Scott Hall, and the Giant. He even makes it down to the final three with Hall and Nash before he goes to dump Hall and Nash, sends them both over with a knee from behind. And now he's won a shot at Goldberg at Starcast, Starcade, easy for me to say. <laughs> uh, it's been a while. You wish. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> um, 
the NWO Hollywood faction is attempting to recruit Lex to their side, but he blows it off. And at Starcade, Lex isn't on the show wrestling, and it's reported in the Observer that the plans were for Lex to take on Scott Steiner, and Lex nixed it. Is that real? What happened there? No, no, I don't know what happened there, but that Lex didn't ever nix anything. Right. That was stupid. That was a dumb thing for Meltzer to write. This is not, I guess, out of character, but no, I don't know what the issue was. I don't know what the change was. That would probably be a Kevin Sullivan issue. He would have had to deal with it. Could have been an injury. Could have been a better idea. Whatever. But it, I guarantee it wasn't Lex throwing a flag and saying no. Absolutely guarantee it. Well, I'm going to give you a chance to nick something. I'm going to give you a chance to throw a flag. Last week, I was trying to make a clever transition to Henson shaving. And we had a pretty heated discussion and we had an argument. We had a debate. We had totally different perspectives. We disagreed, but something we both agree with is Henson shaving will give you the best shave of your life. It's the best razor I've ever had. I think you got to meet Henson shaving. And let me just say that wasn't the original plan. You see, Henson is a family owned aerospace parts manufacturer. These cats made stuff for the international space station and the Mars Rover. And now they're using their aerospace grade CNC machines to cut metal razors that are just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. And that means a secure and stable blade that gives you a vibration free shave and it gets better. The razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. Seriously, Henson shaving wants the best razor, not the best razor business. That means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades, no planned obsolescence. It works with a standard dual edge blade, just like your handsome ass grandfather used to use, just like every wrestler is familiar with. So it has that old school feel you're going to love, but it has the benefits of new school tech. You see, pop pop never had a razor that was thinner than the thickness of the human hair. And this is a razor that will last you a lifetime. So once you own the razor, you only got to buy the blades. Now, if you go buy blades for your your plastic gimmick in your drawer right now, they keep it behind the lock and key at the drugstore. That's how expensive they are. And we're all sort of accustomed to and familiar with if something is better, it costs more money. Well, Henson shaving is one of those rare opportunities where not only is it better, it's also cheaper. How much cheaper? Three to $5 a year. That's what you'll spend to replace the blades. Not three to $5 a week or a month or a quarter, but a doggone year. It's time to say no to subscriptions and say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com slash 83 weeks to pick the razor for you and use the code 83 weeks. You'll get two years worth of blades for free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com slash 83 weeks and use the promo code 83 weeks. So Eric, before I give you a chance to throw the flag. Uh, can we at least agree that Henson shaving is the best razor we've both ever used? It's not only the best, it's the coolest. Like I'm, we talked about this last week. I leave mine out. I normally put my stuff up in the medicine cabinet because Mrs. B, Mrs. B is, she's not OCD, but she's knocking on the door. Like if I leave something out of place, she'll go behind me and she'll move. She knows I'm going to leave this here because I like, it's like comfort food for my face. You know what I mean? I'm shaving with that, what looks like the old school, old fashioned razor, but with amazing technology that gives me a close shave. And like you say, over and over again, and rightfully so, it's amazingly affordable. Check it out. I think you'll be glad you did. Hey, you know what though? We do have to address the elephant in the room. Uh, everybody was talking, chirping last week about our, our silly talk and my silly transition and we up the stakes and you've said on this mm -hmm. program a lot that you like the stakes. I'm going to give you a chance to nix it. I'm going to give you a chance to throw the flag because as you and I have been recording this morning, uh, the news has come out that AEW is going to debut their collision show in Chicago and CM Punk is expected to appear. And the bet, as you recall, was he'll be at the double or nothing pay-per-view, which as we're recording right now has not happened. 
I know what happened last night as you're listening to this, but Eric and I haven't seen it yet. And obviously we haven't seen any announcement about CM Punk, but the reports are he's expected to be there, which was my side of the bet. And listen, you're known along with Charles Robinson for having the best, most iconic head of hair in professional wrestling. And you have been Shay. I think it's happened in WCW and the WWE and TNA. I mean, and listen, if you're not going to throw the flag, I guess it could happen at top guy weekend, but I'm going to give you an out. Here's your chance. Throw the flag. We'll nix it. It's your show. I was just trying to do an ad read and we got out of hand. You want to back out? Give me one second, Conrad. I'll be right back. We'll pick it up from there. Listen to that. He's got to go strategize. He's got to consult. And I'll tell you this, when it comes to consulting about opening your new business, you're going to need a business plan. And I recommend Impera. sign up now and you'll receive free onboarding your first 14 days for free and 24 seven support. We've got a special offer. We can even save 20%, but what is Impera? Well, Impera helps businesses plan for the future by turning ideas into actionable plans. Impera provides visibility into the success of your plan, helping you understand what's working and what's not. Impera is also user friendly. It's fast to start. It helps you and your team quickly get to work on your business plan. You see, it helps you overcome the hardest part of starting a business, which is turning those ideas into plans and then breathing life into them. Think of Impera as like your tag team partner, helping you stay focused on what matters in your business. Impera simplifies the process of business planning, helping you focus on what's important. They eliminate the guesswork. They help you make informed decisions on data, not just gut decisions. And by the way, business planning comes, becomes less overwhelming and more manageable with Impera. I think you got to check it out with Impera. You'll have the peace of mind of knowing that your business plan is well-structured, thought out and achievable. Maybe some of Eric's ideas last week weren't that thought out. Hey, pay no mind to that. Get ahead of the game. Save 20% on your subscription. Use the promo code WrestleBiz at checkout. Launch your business faster and with less effort than ever before. Visit Empira.com slash Eric today and start your journey to success. Empira is spelled E-M-P-I-R-A-A dot com forward slash Eric. That's E-M-P-I-R-A-A dot com forward slash Eric. And be sure to use that promo code WrestleBiz. You'll get 14 days for free. You'll get free onboarding. You'll get 24 seven support and you'll save 20% when you use that promo code WrestleBiz. Okay. No more stalling, Eric. Let's get down. Well, to the I was bit. a stall and I contacted my attorney because I think this is, this is important enough that I wanted some good legal advice. So oh. my question is before I decide to throw a flag or not throw a flag. Okay. Uh, is, um, was this of CM Punk's own volition? Did CM Punk wake up one morning and go, you know what, Tony, I've been, been, I've been kind of a dick and I've been a little <laughs> selfish and, you know, um, so yeah, I'm all in, man, I'm coming. I'm going to be there. I'm a team player. Or was this some kind of legal action that forced his hand? Because without knowing a little bit more of the details, I'm inclined just to hold off another week until I learn a little more. But if indeed, if indeed we decide, I decide, we decide, to actually go through this, of course, doing it at Top Guy Weekend would be the place to do it. And by the way, speaking of Top Guy Weekend, breaking news. Uh-oh. Breaking news. Okay. Just confirmed by Evan Polisher of Ad Free Shows as we're recording. Okay. The one. Wait, wait. Don't make an announcement of a talent. No? No, it's a surprise. It's a surprise. Yeah. Sarsa I love, daddy. I love surprises. Sarsa. You got a spoiler. I don't even know who it is. I haven't touched my phone. I so. do. <laughs> Make plans to join us. By the way, I know you're thinking, well, I can't, I missed it. Yeah. I have to be a top guy for a certain amount of time. Go sign up for an annual today. You'll have the best wrestling weekend of your life. And maybe you can get some of those luscious locks of VB's hair. Cause, uh, <laughs> brother's going home bald. I wonder what Mrs. B is going to think about that. Should be hot. She'll be hot. Does she know about this? Cause bat? you know, you, you, you know, cause I'm wearing that hat, you know, I pop my blue chew. I put on my hat and come, you know, take care of business. It's not the same. I like when you used to wear the hat backwards. And I feel like sometimes when it's like, 
It's like that movie, uh, over the top with Sylvester Stallone when the bills in the front, Hey, it's just Eric trying to not get, uh, not burn his nose or his lips or his cheeks in the sun. But when he spins it around, I'm sure Mrs. B's like, I got to go hide and lock the door. Eric's gotten into yeah, the woods. He's taking care of business. He's taking care of business. If you will, baby. Uh, speaking of business, I want to talk about a little more business. This is fun business. I cannot wait. I am going courtesy of an invitation from our man, Jeff Jarrett. I'm going to be a part of the festivities, May 31st, Springfield, Illinois, the Springfield lucky or shoes baseball team. I'm going to be there. And if anybody happened to catch the video, John Alba decided to put it up on strictly business unbeknownst to me of me throwing out the first pitch in San Jose. Um, I whiffed and I, it wasn't good, but I've been working on it. Oh, you have, so if the opportunity should arise where I get an opportunity throughout the first pitch, May 31st, Springfield, lucky horseshoes. I'm sure there'll be a graphic up here shortly. I think, I think I'm going to go down as one of the best first pitches in the history, of minor league baseball. Go out of your way to check it out. It's shoesbaseball.com. Be a member of the shoe, 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 shoes world order and come see Eric on Wednesday, May 31st. That's right. 48 hours from today, Springfield, Illinois, buckle up. Eric Bischoff is coming your way. Tickets are on sale now. Shoesbaseball.com. Fight plus is the ultimate digital platform for live sports and entertainment. And they're now offering a free seven day trial at tryfight.com. Fight Plus is packed with a premium live event schedule, over a thousand hours of live action every year, and a library of more than 4,000 hours on demand, plus exclusive content you can't get anywhere else. Fight is a great partner of ours. They support us, so let's support them. Give that free seven day trial a shot, and you'll be a member for life. That's tryfight.com. T R Y F I T E dot com. Uh, listen, we said when we started today's program that we were going to do uh, Lex Luger's 98 and 99, I think we're going to table it. We're going to wrap it up. We know what Lex did now for 1998. We're going to start on Lex's 99 some other time. We'll pick it up with the finger poke of doom. Cause I feel like we're going to get sideways in a hurry on that one. Uh, I, I also want to <laughs> mention that, uh, we've got some some bonus episodes that are up live right now at adfreeshows.com. Um, and as I understand it, we're both going to be doing a little travel this summer too. You're going to be doing a little UK tour with our friends over at inside the ropes, right? After top guy weekend, I'm going to be cruising down to Australia to hang out with my pal, Scott Demore. And speaking of Australia, a few weeks back, we took a look at the Hulkamania Australia tour. We alluded to that a little earlier when we talked about this rumored Goldberg self-promoted four city retirement tour. Well, you and I talked about the show, you and Cassio watched it over at adfreeshows.com. You watched some rare match footage, some rare promos, some rare press conferences, even a rare bikini contest. I say rare because the footage was never released. So you're watching fan cam type footage and some of the stuff that was a very limited release. It's available now at adfreeshows.com. Get Eric's commentary. It's one thing to hear about it. It's another thing to see it. And wait till you see the results from advertising on our program here. Go check it out at advertisewitheric.com. If your business targets men that are 25 to 54 years old, there's no better place to advertise than right here. You hear some of the same sponsors year after year after year. You want to know why that is? Because it really works. Find out how affordable it is at advertisewitheric.com. Uh, Eric's book is out right now available on Amazon. It's grateful. Uh, I've read it twice now. I read it my last time I was at the beach and, uh, I just love it, man. He's open. He's honest. You don't read a lot of wrestling books like this. Can't recommend it enough. Love to have your interactions on social. Eric is very active. He is at E Bischoff. Our show handle is at 83 weeks on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And the easiest, cheapest, best way to support our show is to check us out on YouTube. It's 83 weeks on youtube.com. That's 83 weeks on youtube.com. And we've got a ton of new merch, a ton of new swag over at box And we might be getting some new swag, but 
I don't guess we'll need any 83 weeks combs or hairbrushes because you won't have a need for those pretty soon. We'll see. It ain't over till it's over. I love it. I love that you're doubling down. I love that about you. I hope you guys had a, uh, a fun Memorial day and, uh, we'll see you next week right here. Talking all things, 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson with save with Conrad.com. You've heard me bragging on the podcast for years about helping people save money on their current house. But did you know that I can help you with your next house as well? That's right. We can get you into your next house with zero down. No money down loan programs are still available. And I know it sounds too good to be true, but we can do it for you. And by the way, home ownership is more affordable than you might think. We routinely turn renters into homeowners and we hear back that their new house payment is more affordable than what they were paying in rent. Why would you keep doing that? Stop throwing your money away, paying for someone else's mortgage, and start building wealth for your family. And let my family help at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit to do this. We can improve credit scores down to the 500s, and it's worth mentioning, we never say no. We say not yet, but here's how. You need a game plan to buy a house, and that's where we come in at SaveWithConrad.com. We'll ask you, what down payment do you want to make? And zero is an acceptable answer. And what monthly payment do you want? And then it's time to go shopping. Find out how easy it is and how affordable it is to become a homeowner at SaveWithConrad.com.